Okay. Yeah. Good morning. So we'll start off uh, this morning. I, I'd love to share with you some information about the Open Source Security Foundation. The Open Source Security Foundation uh, got started in uh, August of last year. And the reasons for our creating this foundation is that um, we believe that open source software is a common good. Um, it powers the world's most uh, critical infrastructure today. Um, there are security issues in open source software, and um, we believe that you know, creating a secure ecosystem end to end, including the supply chain all the way from open source components to you know services that get delivered on cloud operating systems um, requires all of us to participate and uh, no one organization can do it alone. Um, so for that reason, we got together with a bunch of other companies. So we've got, um, I, I'm from Microsoft, but so we've got Microsoft, IBM, um, Google, GitHub, uh, and, a, you know, and a bunch more and uh, Red Hat uh, and some others that, um, you know, from the folks that are on the call today, we'll, we'll tell you more when we introduce ourselves. So, um, so it's quite a group that's come together. The, uh, the mission for the foundation is to inspire and enable the community to come together to secure the open source that, that we all depend on. Uh, in our first few months, uh, we've been really growing a bunch. We started off with six member organizations, or maybe it was eight, and um, now we are you know, up to 36. We have 250 people who are active. Um, and you know we're getting. I'll tell you some more about some some cool things that we're doing that are um, getting some good traction. In the Open Source Security Foundation, we do have a number of working groups, and um, they work on different uh, aspects of security. So one deals with identifying security threats. We've got a group that's working on um, creating uh, uh, you know the best security tools and making them available to everyone. Uh, we've got a group work focusing on best practices and vulnerability uh, vulnerabilities and other. Um, we're looking at how we ensure, um, uh, how we allow identities in the open source ecosystem to attest themselves. Um, and then we've got another group that is looking at uh, how we go about securing, providing hands-on help for securing critical projects. So that's, that's you know, some of the background for the organization. There are, I wanted to share with you all some resources that are available to the community today um, that we provide through the Open Source Security Foundation. And those include um, an edX course, which is a, um, a training course that is free for anyone to take. And it includes three um, sessions related to that. And um, there's more information uh, on edX and um, you know, there are links to it in this slide, so we'll be sharing that later. Um, it focuses on practical steps that anyone can do, um, even with limited resources. Another thing, uh, another resource that we have available is our best practices badge. So what this is, is it allows uh, open source software maintainers to go through a set of best practices and indicate for each one of those if they're following those. Some of those best practices might include things like having two reviewers, um, using multi-factor authentication for code commits, uh, setting up a CI CD system for ongoing testing, things like that. And um, at the end of going through those series of questions, then there's a badge that, um, that the project is able to qualify for anything from, um, uh, I forget what the starting level is, um, up to uh, up to gold and silver. So, um, and then that badge is something that people can display on their website. And also it's a great place where um, developers can go when they're trying to look at the, uh, maybe projects that they're uh, intending to use and incorporate in their own project to understand the security profile of those projects. Another 
resource that we have is the security scorecard scorecard and this is something that developers can run against their own projects or against other projects um, and get a quick look at this um, this um, security profile for that project and the badge currently includes information like number of contributors um, if there are CI tests being run against it if there are um, uh, 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 you know, if there's a security policy file, et cetera. So, um, and that's something that uh, you can learn more about um, from the OpenSSF GitHub location. Just a couple more. One is we do partner with, OpenSSF does partner with a number of other security related organizations. And one of those is OWASP. And um, an interesting project there that we're working on, uh, jointly working on is the ZAP project. And this is something that developers who are creating um, web applications can use to, um, so they connect through this, um, they can connect to the ZAP proxy and then um, have their, you know, a server, um, kind of uh, work against their application to identify security threats. So um, that's a great project. And then the last one to share with you is another one that we're doing in cooperation with OWASP. And um, there they have a security knowledge framework. And so this is a place where developers can go to to get code examples for how to um, to do certain tasks and implement them in a secure way. And also checklists for developing uh, projects um, in a secure way and knowledge base for looking up um, additional information. So those are a few of the resources that are currently available. Um, we are encouraging people to get involved. It's a great community. It's an open and friendly community. And um, we do have, again, from the slide, um, if you or if you go to the OpenSSF.org website, you can you can find out more. We've got a GitHub mailing list, Slack channel, um, blogs, and and all those great things. All right, so that's that's it about the OpenSSF. Back to you, Jennifer. Great, thank you, Kay. Um, and for those that were unable to see the slides, because we, we might have had some technical difficulties there, you can go to OpenSSF.org, and we will post the slides from today's presentation for everyone, and there's a bunch of links to resources in there as well. Um, so for the remainder of the time that we have with you, we wanted to do a panel where we were going to talk about um, many interesting things as it relates to open source and security. Um, so we want to talk about threat modeling. We want to talk about historical examples where things have gone terribly wrong, or sometimes right, but usually wrong. Um, um, we want to talk about the different ways of developers and maintainers, um, the things they can do to make their projects more secure. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about coordinated disclosure because it's kind of mysterious um, and some other tips and tricks along the way. Um, so before, before we get right into that, um, maybe we'll give a quick introduction of each of us for about a minute or so to give you a bit of an idea of our backgrounds. Um, to start out, my name is Jennifer Furnick. Um, I am the global head of research at NCC Group. NCC Group is the largest or one of the largest security testing companies in the world. So I lead a team of um, a few hundred people that are um, both consultants and researchers, and we just try to hack everything we possibly can. Um, my background is I trained as a cryptographer and as a mathematician, um, so I kind of grew up thinking mostly about the math of secret codes and um, ultimately how quantum computers can break those, um, but then I ran a big security team at a bank, and now I'm at NCC Group and really excited to be a part of OpenSSF. I could go next. <clears throat> Thanks, Jennifer. First of all, thank you everyone for tuning in to our uh, panel discussion. Also, thanks uh, Fast Backstage for hosting us. Um, super glad to be here. Uh, my name is Raula Kakula. I'm an executive director in JP Morgan Chase. Um, I do run application security and mobile security groups there. Part of my responsibilities uh, for that role is securing the open source usage in the form and also securing the open source contributions back to the community. So part of the job is also encouraging the teams to be more involved in open source security community and helping them do it properly, right? Um, I've been using and developing open source security for almost like 20 to 23 years now, um, early versions of Linux, PHP, all kind of good stuff. Uh, I'm, I was lucky to, 
work on open source technology for my career too, most of the time, except I think a couple of years. I had to work in a hardcore .NET and uh, SQL Server shop. Uh, but <laughs> hey, uh, after one year, I was successfully able to convince them move to MySQL and Mono Framework. So I did my job uh, evangelizing the open source software. Uh, after working for uh, 10 years in the, the development, I, after a few security mishaps, uh, some are my own. Um, I I got interested in security, and last ten years, I've been mostly focusing on running the security engineering teams. On the other side, on uh, how do we help the developers secure the the software and code they write? So I'm not as actively developing as much as I used to be um, because I'm running these teams. But I'm super interested still um, in in the overall securing the ecosystem. And I also serve on the open source. Uh, Security Foundation as a governing board member. And that's how I got the privilege to work with these awesome guys on the screen. Glad to be here. Okay, I can go next. So I'm Kay Williams. I uh, work at Microsoft. I'm in the Azure office of the CTO. And my role at Microsoft is to work on um, our industry uh, efforts related to supply chain security. So I am the chair of the governing board at the OpenSSF. I also am the co-chair of an organization that's working on a software bill of materials uh, specification. And, um, and then inside of Microsoft, I work with <laughs> a lot of um, our teams um, looking at their practices for how they ingest um, uh, open source, but not just open source, you know, ingest external artifacts, um, scan them. Um, we try to clone, uh, to clone everything. So we've got a copy we can use in case something uh, goes down from a, an external partner. Um, and, um, and we even try to rebuild this image excuse me, as much as we can. So, um, so you know, that whole process of um, supply chain and um, uh, consuming and using software are things that I look at for Azure, but for, for Microsoft. And then I'm excited to be working at the industry level to partner with others. And I guess I'll round up the introductions. Hi, everybody, I'm Krobe. Uh, thanks again to the FOSS backstage team for allowing us to have this opportunity to talk to you all and to my peers here from the OpenSSF and the industry. I am the program architect for Red Hat Product Security. Uh, Red Hat is a company that has been involved in uh, the open source uh, movement for well over 25 years. Uh, product security has been securing open source for, this is our 20th year. I look so young, I know. But, um, <laughs> prior, uh, we're responsible for the vulnerability management, um, the governance and SDLC activities for all the products in the portfolio, as well as uh, overseeing governance for our supply chain, um, which absolutely is deeply embedded within the OSS community. Before that, I've worked in several Fortune 500 uh, companies. I've been in banking, medical, and insurance. So I have a lot of experience with regulation and uh, Looking forward to our exciting and engaging panel. I hope you all enjoy it. Awesome. And on that note, we may as well get started. Um, so let's just start off like, why do we care? Um, why does securing the open source ecosystem matter? And why should we care about security? I'll throw down some stats and then I'll let my esteemed <laughs> friends here uh, add on to that. The uh, Linux Foundation did a report last year um, called the uh, census of vulnerabilities in uh, in the core. And their analysis showed that approximately uh, between 80 and 90% of all uh, commercial software has leveraged open source components. So the exposure is very broad. And then I went over to my pals at GitHub and they are one of the largest uh, source code management tools on the web. Not the only, but one of the large ones. And just some stats there is last year alone, there were over 60 million new repositories added. Uh, they have they track about 56 million individual developers that contribute both directly to upstream or through you know, private projects or corporate sponsored projects. And last year they said they had about on the order of 1.9 billion uh, contributions to code. 
So from my perspective, the volume and importance of open source is, is huge now. Um, yeah, and so I can uh, speak to it for, um, you know, really why Microsoft is involved in this effort. We, you know, we just understand that it's not, that, you know, in order to provide high quality products to our end customers, we have to, um, you know, it, we have to uh, help the help and be engaged in the ecosystem to, you know, to to raise the quality of, of the products for uh, of the software that that's produced for that everyone produces. Yeah, I could I could bring in the, the consumer perspective to here. In my opinion, uh, the two most critical element for any company, however big or small, to be succeed are innovation and build and maintain the customer trust. Right. And open source software fuels the innovation. There's no doubt about it. If you look at any modern application stack, we have hundreds of open source component. It allows the teams to build on huge ecosystem already exists. It allows the, team, the teams to focus on the business problem rather than the scaffolding, right? So there's no doubt about it. On the other hand, building customer trust is actually very hard. Maintaining it is actually harder and losing it is actually a lot easier. A simple <laughs> data breach is, is what it takes, right? So in my, for me, securing the open source ecosystem is very crucial to sustain the innovation for the companies to succeed while maintaining the customer trust uh, that they need and that's a mandatory so and as Krab mentioned like open source software development is growing tremendously i mean you see the numbers like how big that makes it a lot more important to secure it to achieve these goals yeah, I guess to build on that point, I mean, um, we know that open source software is what underlies, you know, our core internet infrastructure. All of the enterprises around the world are dependent upon open source. I imagine like a day without open source, um, I think every company would shut down, right? So um, it's, it's foundational to everything that we do in a tech driven society and technology increasingly takes over our lives. So if we think about those ripple effects, the security of these things really matters. Um, and it, it, security is my life's work and will continue to be hopefully for a very long time. Um, but there's a lot of, I think, unique problems that we can think about in the space of open source. Um, so ways that make it different from securing enterprise software. Um, there's many of these examples, but a couple things would be like that it's deobfuscated public facing source code. Um, so it's easier for attackers to take a look. They don't actually have to reverse engineer any binaries that reduces um, you know the obstacles for an attacker to take a look at the source code and find vulnerabilities on top of that um, one of the other strengths of open source that is actually one of the things we have to cope with differently in security is that it's you've got this distributed community driven development you don't necessarily know all of the other contributors you don't necessarily know their motivations um, and we can't always assume that they are our friends often they are and they feel like our friends and so many of our best friends we We've all met within open source, but we also have to keep in mind that on a planet with billions of people, perhaps there will be malicious actors that want to introduce subtle, dangerous things into our code bases, and we need to be able to cope with that. Um, beyond that, I think there's this tragedy of the commons um, where we feel like just because people can look at the source code that they necessarily have looked at the source code. And time and again, we've seen examples where there are code bases that support billions or trillions of dollars of industry activity that underlie all kinds of important like public service and nonprofit projects that are just important across the board that at the end of the day were sustained by a thousand dollars and a couple of volunteers. And we'll even talk about some of those examples in this panel. Beyond that, I mean, when I think about why security matters, security is a prerequisite to so many things that we value in our society. Um, security is a prerequisite to privacy. It's not a trade-off as is co commonly said. Um, without security, you can't make assurances about what your system does. And that includes Includes how private it is and how the data is protected. Um, and privacy is important to all kinds of civil, liberty, civil liberties and other things that we care about within our society and wish to advance further. Um, security is also a prerequisite to safety. 
You can't guarantee that a system will behave in a way that is safe for the users or those impacted by the system if you can't make assurances about what it actually does, and you can't guarantee that the code isn't being uh, played with to do dangerous things. And um, security is a prerequisite to ethical technology. So uh, a popular topic in the last few years has been ethical AI and how um, it's important to build <clears throat> inclusive AI systems that, um, you know, lack bias and that are more um, equitable and representative and that um, don't propagate discriminatory behavior. But we can't actually assure anything about an AI system or any computational system if we don't have control and assurance around that system. So security is really a prerequisite to making any kind of guarantees that are so important in, in society. Um, so maybe let's go into some of the historical examples we had mentioned. Um, I'm wondering if anyone wants to point us to some historical examples where vulnerabilities in open source components have had a large scale impact. And maybe Krobe, do you want to start? Absolutely, I can do that. Um, I'll kick us off with the granddaddy of them all. Uh, one of my least favorite topics are branded <laughs> flaws, uh, vanity or celebrity flaws, and the incident that caused this trend within the industry was uh, Heartbleed, which was a flaw within OpenSSL. Uh, and it, this technology helps secure and make a transmission between different elements on a network and between systems confidential. And it, the technology was so good, it got embedded virtually everywhere in the networking world and on the internet. And unfortunately, uh, it was discovered back in, um, 2012 or 2013, that there was a flaw that allowed uh, the exposure of more data. And as the world dug into the problem and was working to fix it, it you, they discovered there was legitimately like two people that were maintaining the project that millions on the globe depended on, and they did not have any funding or any backing to really help them. And that's where uh, you know, organizations like the Linux Foundation and other groups started to uh, start to fix this problem. Yeah, I heard something about Heartbleed that it was like they had a handful of volunteers and one person that worked full time and like $2,000 in donations the year that the vulnerability was found. And like this was for OpenSSL, a crypto library that underlies all kinds of like banking and secure communications and all kinds of things like that. Yeah. And actually my former boss, Mark Cox, was on the security team for OpenSSL. And that's the whole reason I came back to Red Hat was because of this Heartbleed was the incident that made us understand we need to focus on these big things or more closely. That's awesome. I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah another example is, I believe it was the ES Lint um, project. Uh, and so there, uh, in this case, there was a project that had, you know, one maintainer and you know a lot of usage and you know, i forget the exact numbers but one maintainer and um and he was you know kind of he'd been doing it for a long time was moving off to something else um someone who had been somewhat active in the project um, volunteered to take over and, and become the maintainer and he said great yes thank you and um, then it turned out that that person um uh, then committed code that uh, you know that got distributed everywhere that um, used the that you know set set it up so that there was Bitcoin mining being done through or made available um, through that code. So there's another uh, example. Yeah, the one um, interesting to me was the shell shock in 2014. Um, it was uh, impacting uh, Bash. Obviously, Bash is everywhere on pretty much every mission you can get to, right? Uh, was actually attack as a, a privileged escalation attack. So the attacker can send a, a well-crafted request modifying uh, the server to run the commands what they want to, So which is a actually a high-impacted attack. What's interesting about this attack was the original bug was introduced um, accidentally or unintentionally back in, I think it's 1989. Uh, and Shellshock was found in 2014. So you can see it, it took 25 years to find it. And by the time you have millions and millions of the, the host got impacted. So that made this really worse. The attack is so simple. Anyone with like few lines of the command can now bring down the host 
to distributed denial of service because you simply do sleep 100, sleep 200 commands with these parameters as, as the request. And so within hours, you see like thousands of servers being attacked. And I think the numbers were like within a week, you see 1.5 million attacks per day um, being carried out. And this was like 2014. And sad thing is it's still relevant here because there are so, so many hosts impacted. There are quite a number of them unpatched still. So <laughs> that makes this, this open source security is, is kind of tricky is because it's so prevalent and it, the patching is involved, fixing the issue, and also improving the awareness of it is all the part of is kind of that makes it challenging and interesting. Yeah, I think what's really wild about all of this when we talk through these examples is that if you look at the CVE databases, so the places where we track known vulnerabilities in known systems, there's tens of thousands. Like I think there was 16,000 reported in 2018 alone. And a thousand of those were critical like game over vulnerabilities. So these examples that we're talking about, now that is across proprietary and open source software, but still these, these examples that we're talking about, they're not rare. Um, we can assume safely I think that there are many, several, dozens, hundreds, maybe even thousands of vulnerabilities being committed into code bases today alone, like just today. And that's happening every day. So finding scalable ways to deal with all this stuff and working closer with maintainers with a respect for what maintainers are trying to do for their projects is absolutely essential for us from a security perspective. Um, I'd love to talk a little bit more about threat modeling because like security is often thought of as vulnerabilities in source code, like we were just talking about, but it's actually a much broader spectrum of things that we can think about. Um, you know, in the software development life cycle. So I would ask like, what other end to end or like SDLC um, life cycle things do open source maintainers need to think about to help secure their projects better? Since I run that working group as part of the open SSF, I can kick us off again. And I know Rao has a lot of experience with this. Um, from my perspective, when you're talking about an open source maintainer, um, this is, they are men and women and they, it's a broad spectrum of folks. You'll have a one or two person project. Maybe it's two ladies in Peoria, Illinois that are working on a graduate project and they, they push it up to a source code repo. And it could be very large corporations like Microsoft or Intel or Red Hat that sponsor a project because it's critical to their core uh, portfolio. But it's just a broad spectrum and not, all of these maintainers, you know, A, have security training. They, they might not be formally schooled in security defensive coding techniques, and they might not have access to tools or uh, infrastructure to be able to uh, execute on their job. You know, they have a lot of different motivations go into why someone uh, donates software to the world to make the world a better place. And you know, right off the bat, some simple things you can do, and again, the Linux Foundation has a really good paper that kind of spoke to uh, securing the open source supply chain. And you can implement things like, you know, ver verifying your maintainers, using things like two-factor authentication, implementing automated testing into your CI CD pipeline, you know, just, just doing very basic like dependency checks or known vulnerability checks will help eliminate broad swaths of problems before they get propagated downstream. Uh, yeah, I know, I know Rao has some thoughts on this. Yeah, I think you covered actually really good points, Krab. Yeah, the other areas, it's not just about the code it has the vulnerabilities, right? Like even the developer uh, local infrastructure itself is a attack vector. Your workstations, your network, your IDEs, attackers can compromise them and get hold of the, some of the source code, which is not released to public yet they can get hold of the zero day vulnerabilities researchers reported to you so that they could exploit them. They could even commit code on behalf of you without you realizing. So there's a, there's a lot of danger within that. And also once the code is completed, you're pushing to GitHub. Okay, mentioned about multi-factor authentication for the source code repository. Attacker can actually target that and get hold of your credentials. And then publishing to the, the package managers they can publish a, a, a different version of the package which you get hold of the, your credentials. And then interestingly, um, uh, the one other thing I forgot to mention is the developer 
build and CI environment is another threat attacker. Attacker can get hold of your build configuration. They can modify, for example, NPMRC file and then point it to their control registry and then could do damage, right? So I think monitoring all these systems, not just the looking for vulnerabilities in the code is very important to keep your security. Um, one of the things I would like to point is OpenSSF in the initial stages, when we started, we started with collecting all the threats possible in open source um, ecosystem and ways to remediate. So we published a paper, Michael from Microsoft uh, published a paper with, which is like a 45 pages, but it's an interesting read. Uh, it's published on the opensf.org uh, website. Uh, please check it out. I mean, we only touched a few of them. It goes over every step of the STLC. Yeah, threats, risks, and vulnerabilities in the ecosystem. And it's Michael Scavetta who wrote that great paper. Really good paper. And that term, that thing that we're talking about right now, for those that are not familiar, is called threat modeling. So when we're thinking about what are all the threats that are impacting this thing, not just what are the potential vulnerabilities in the source code itself, that we may have made mistakes that lead to exploitable vulnerabilities, or that someone may have inserted malicious code into a specific code base. When we think about that whole space of like someone reading your emails where you might be receiving a vulnerability report or someone taking over your account because you don't have 2FA. That's all when we think about our threat model. We're trying to think about what are the things we actually need to worry about here. And it's an important exercise because um, often we assume that people are thinking the exact same way we are or that they're motivated in the same ways that we are. So we might neglect other motivations of these threat actors. But also we have to think about like if you're using dodgy airport Wi-Fi or if you haven't patched the laptop you used to commit code in a long time, those things can be really dangerous. So we have to always think about those things. Um, but let's get back to vulns. I, I love talking about vulnerabilities. So let's do a little bit more of that. Um, what are the different ways of going about finding vulnerabilities in software? Okay, I know you think a lot about supply chain. Um, can you talk to us like what that means in a security context and how we should think about that? Um, yeah, so in the, you know, when you think about supply chain, there are any piece of software that you um, use or that you write um, has dependencies on other components and the dependencies, you know, spread out into a very large tree pretty quickly. Um, so, um, you know, when you're thinking about vulnerabilities, it's not just vulnerabilities in your code, but vulnerabilities in all the code that you bring in. So, you know, there are some tools and a lot of the, um, you know, systems that the developers use for creating software now are starting to provide tools in some automatic ways to, to let developers know about, um, about issues in their dependencies. So with GitHub, for example, there are, um, there's a dependency tracker, um, uh, uh, dependency trap, uh, excuse me, graph, I think is what it is, um, which, you know, lets you see all of the dependencies, dependencies that you're consuming. There are a number of commercial resources that will, um, um, you know, do scanning of your code and show you what your dependencies are and what CVEs exist in your code. Um, so, you know, so one aspect of vulnerabilities is just understanding that, you know, the things that you bring in can bring vulnerabilities with them. Um, in the OpenSSF, we're also looking at doing um, some work where we're sharing uh, and um, some analysis that different companies have done, Microsoft and NCC Group and others um, that talk about the quality of various components. And so, you know, one thing that's really good to do is just understanding what what components you're making bets on and doing a little bit of research to, to make sure that the um, that there aren't serious issues with those. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Kay. Um, and in thinking about those vulnerabilities that can come up in our own code bases or in the dependencies that we're making use of, um, sometimes it's interesting to talk about like how do people find bugs in the first place? And that's really what my team specializes in. So um, maybe I'll spend a few a few moments talking a bit about how do we actually find bugs? Um, and there's a bunch of different ways of doing this. So we've talked a little bit about tooling. And what do we mean by tooling? Um, some of the common categories of basic tools that people can use, you can think of them is code scanners, because basically they are. Um, static analysis is one where we look at a piece of, or 
a computer looks at a piece of code for us and it looks for dangerous patterns within um, the this code that has been committed. And this varies from programming language to programming language because some programming languages are safer and they don't let you do dangerous things, whereas other ones, <clears throat> C, uh, let you do very dangerous things. So um, for example, if you were to talk to Kay's colleagues at Microsoft in the Security Response Center and you ask them, like, what are these different categories of vulnerabilities? Which ones have the biggest impact on your systems and everyone else's systems? They would probably say memory corruption, where something weird goes wrong in the memory and you can actually have malicious behavior that was not intended. Um, that's a bit of a hand wavy explanation, but I suppose like my overall point is that there's many different types of vulnerabilities. We can categorize them. And then when you have these tools, they can look for how those vulnerabilities show up within different programming languages. Um, so static analysis is really powerful. And there's a lot of like free static analysis tools that people can use. Um, there's also fuzzing. So this is a fun one. You're basically throwing randomness at something until a program will crash. And you're trying to just see where things don't exactly behave as you would have expected. And sometimes when you find those crashes, you can actually find vulnerabilities that are exploitable that an attacker could use to do dangerous things. Um, so there's a lot of ways that we can use tooling as researchers um, to find bugs and also as defenders or as maintainers can use tooling to get rid of bugs before people on my team can exploit them basically. Um, the, the other more manual ways of thinking about this are doing things like code review. So in the same way that you would do a code review for quality within um, a project, we would do it for security and we would look manually through it. We might have tools that guide us as to where we should look more, um, but it's often a manual kind of bespoke expert process. Um, the thing that NCC Group specializes in is security testing or penetration testing, which is basically you come to NCC Group and you go, I want to get hacked, but I want the hackers that do it to be on my side. So can you guys hack it? And then please tell us how you hacked it and how we can fix the hacking. Um, and, and that's what we we all do. So um, in our client, we do this because companies hire us to do it. In our research, we do it on both proprietary and open source software. And then what we do is something called vulnerability disclosure. So we find something dangerous in a piece of software. We need to tell the person so that they can fix it before someone that has maybe more evil Evil intentions than we do finds that same vulnerability. Um, and maybe that's that's something we can talk about next. Um, so there's this idea of coordinated disclosure or coordinated vulnerability disclosure. And it's probably one of the least well understood, most confusing and contentious issues in security people working with like developers. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit more about like what makes coordinated disclosure difficult? How does it work? Um, how is it different or how does it work within um, open source software specifically? Um, so maybe I'll just start with a couple of examples to get us all on the same page and then we'll share our different perspectives on vulnerability disclosure. Um, so what do I mean when I say vulnerability? I mean that there's some flaw in software, intended or unintended, a lot of them are committed by mistake because they're really hard to spot, even if you're an expert developer. Um, a vulnerability is some flaw in a software that could be exploited or it could not. An exploit is when researchers, for example, hackers, um, malicious actors will write something that interacts with the vulnerability to take advantage of it to, for example, get more permissions in a system or to do some other kind of like not intended behavior on the behalf of the developers. So to do something dangerous. And when we talk about coordinated disclosure, that is when the person who has found the vulnerability doesn't want to exploit it and like mine Bitcoin or do something evil. Instead, they want to come back to the developer and say, hey, like, Security is my thing. I found this bug. I want to help you fix this bug. Um, so coordinated disclosure is a really powerful kind of construct that we have in the security community, where um, you know a vast majority of the people that do security and that find these exploitable vulnerabilities don't go and sell them on the dark web, don't sell them to governments, don't personally exploit them for their own gain, but instead they knock on the doors of whoever has been developing that software and they try to coordinate a way of communicating about this. Um, and, and of fixing the bug and ultimately reporting it to users. So that typical flow is like, we'll find a bug in something, we'll go to them and we'll say, hey, we're researchers, we have this bug, we wanna tell you about it, we need a secure way of communicating with you so that you know an actual adversary can't see the report we're sending you and then exploit the vulnerability we're trying to fix. Um, often the recipient will say, great, like here's our secure communication, maybe PGP encryption. 
send us the report. And then there's a back and forth explaining like how it works, how to fix it, all of that. And the ultimate goal is that the developer, and this can be proprietary software or open source, um, will patch the vulnerability, issue an update, and then often both the developer and the researcher will issue something called a technical advisory that explains what happened, why, like what is the impact, how we fixed it and all of that. But we only make it public after it's fixed so that people that have up-to-date software are safe. Um, and I guess from a researcher perspective, this is challenging with vendors and with open source projects, but perhaps for different reasons. Um, one of the things that we have to worry about is that, um, especially with small open source projects, not all projects have people that necessarily understand the bug reports that we're reporting because it is a super niche thing and it's not something we should expect all developers to know. Um, and they can't necessarily write the patches either. Um, if this just isn't an area they've thought about, memory corruption isn't their thing, but they can build amazing systems at scale, um, they might struggle with like, what do I do now? And how should I, why should I trust this random hacker on the internet that's telling me to push changes to my code, right? Like, why should anyone trust me or someone from my team? Um, so that's a huge challenge. Um, sometimes as well, maintainers won't see the danger in a particular vulnerability. Um, and they'll say, oh, that's not a security issue. And we'll say, believe us, it is. Um, so, so that's a challenge, right? Because we're speaking different languages. We have different areas of expertise and um, we can't necessarily expect developers and maintainers to be able to understand all this nuance security stuff right out of the box. Um, sometimes patching isn't a priority. Um, open source is often done for free by people out of the goodness of their heart trying to build really important, interesting innovations in software. Maybe writing a patch to some obscure bug that we report to them is not a priority. And I get that. Um, and also like projects can go unmaintained and sometimes we just can't even find anyone to report the bug to and there isn't any clear way of getting it fixed. There's no way of necessarily getting a patch pushed out and those are all concerns. Um, so I think a common misconception um, that researchers get from open source projects, but also from some less security mature enterprise software companies as well, is that vulnerability disclosure is adversarial, like that we're coming to like prove that you did something bad or whatever. And in fact, um, it's, 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 pretty much never that that way. If someone had a vulnerability and they wanted to be evil, they would be exploiting it in the wild and not telling you. The people that are knocking at your door do have your best intentions at heart in general. And we're just trying to communicate in a way that works for everybody. Um, so we're really just saying, here's something dangerous and here's how we think you can fix it. Um, but anyway, I feel like I've been talking for a long time. Rao, Krobe, I'd love to hear like a developer perspective an open source maintainer perspective on vulnerability disclosure. Right. I think you raised a really good point, um, Jennifer, and then I, in my opinion, vulnerability disclosures are actually a good learning opportunities for open source developers and maintainers, right? Um, so it's important, I think, when, when the researcher reached out to the, like, to the de developer or maintainer is to provide more details on what is the problem, provide more details on how it could be exploited, and also suggestion on how to fix it. And maybe even offer the help to validate the fix, right? That because you know how this is exploited. That's very important. That would help uh, the developers to actually get interested in security. Also, I mean, I'll tell a quick story. Like, I'm not going to take much time. I was with one of the recent conferences and talking to this awesome security leader, and she she is running a product security division for this security firm, and a few years back she was one of the open source maintainer for a package and no idea about security. And one weekend she got an email from this random guy on internet in a way, a little bit of threatening email saying, oh, you got a big problem in your package. You got to fix it immediately. So she got up like a little bit like frightened and was like going through the code multiple times and couldn't find the problem. It was, looks good to me. So after a couple of hours, she ended up reaching out to the uh, whoever contacted her and saying, hey, actually, I couldn't find the problem. Can you explain me where is the problem? So, and luckily this guy was actually gone through the code, explained where the problem is and helped fix the issue. And they were able to fix the issue that Saturday. And she was telling me the, the story. What it made was she got interested in security and realized, oh, they actually, can my code do that? Which is a kind of revelation, right? Like it's interesting. And that led her interested in security, learned more about it. Now she's running a 
a big role in the security form. So as you can see, I think that good nature of it, vulnerable disclosure kind of made her career. You could have been actually broke her career and probably like made her leave the open source because, oh, this is too much work for me, right? Because I'm not getting any recognition or not help. So I think you raised a really good point. I think that most of the researchers actually are there to help. They're not really finding problems in your code for sake of sh blaming you or telling you there's something wrong. Instead, they're helping you. I think uh, it's, it's a, good, a good point. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, like, I think we're just really deeply curious about systems in 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 a way that I think we share with developers and with maintainers, um, but perhaps from a different angle. And and there's so many ways of specializing in computing that it makes sense that some people would be able to find these like super niche vulnerabilities in code, but that that's not a universal skill set. Um, I know that we are coming upon our time. We've got like four or five minutes left. So I have two questions that I want to ask. We're going to try and fit them in. Um, so the next one, um, I just love maybe Crobe, if you could just run through like a whirlwind, like as an open source developer or maintainer, what can you do to improve the security of your project? Aside from listening to and participating in the Open Source <laughs> Security Foundation, yeah. um, opensf.org, um, there's a couple of <laughs> really practical things you could take away. And first off, implementing things like multi-factor, two-factor authentication in your project for commits um, can greatly reduce the attack surface an attacker could come in and impersonate you. Um, doing things like having implementing change control and change tracking in your project that as commits are made, that's recorded who, what, when, where. Uh, doing things, making sure that you have a unique identifier for each release. That helps the downstream folks that come in and do the vulnerability response or the scanning or the pen testing later to identify this vulnerability was introduced at the X version, X release. Um, integrating security testing into your pipeline critical. The more automation, the better. Um, unfortunately, uh, tooling is great, but it's a lot of this is going to come down to you're going to get the best review by a manual peer review with a qualified security person. But tooling, you can automate the thing to a point where you can pass off quality information to that person that might help you out. Um, thinking about uh, your dependencies, you know, you, you write some software and has some functionality and you require other software outside of your scope, understanding what dependencies you interact with that you require and listening to any vulnerabilities or reports or problems with those dependencies. So you can potentially make changes if you need to, um, you know, doing things like cryptography where you're digitally signing uh, and having being able to prove that a certain commit was made by a certain person. Um, a lot of different ways you can do that. And then uh, just paying attention to some general tracking or mediating vulnerabilities in, in your code. And again, your, your dependent projects. That's important as both you know a, a good steward, but also to protect your project, your software, is you need to understand kind of who else could come in there and ruin your day because of a dependency you're using that is faulty. Thank you so much. Yeah, and I think I think these are some great suggestions, and it's things we're trying to formalize in OpenSSF. So if you are a maintainer or developer listening to this talk right now, and there's a gap between what we're saying and resources you need, let us know, because we're trying to create the educational materials, the courses, all of that. If you can identify gaps between what we're offering here and what we really need to build this bridge between these communities, please do let us know. Um, to finish off, and we might run like a couple of minutes over, sorry. <laughs> um, I would love to talk about what happens if we don't intervene. So if we ignore security totally, um, will security and open source get better or worse? What will be the consequence? And, and maybe I'll, I'll kick off with my thoughts, but I'd love to hear from, from the entire panel. Um, from my view, I guess from the researcher view, um, there's a growing number of vulnerabilities in the wild, right? Every day we can expect that the number of lines of code that's being committed on average is probably more than the previous day. And we have no reason to believe that there's less vulnerabilities in that code. Actually, we have good reasons to believe there's more vulnerabilities in that code. As code bases get more and more complex, um, it gets harder and harder to filter out vulns just through doing scanning. So like as Crobe had mentioned, it's not just about tooling. If the tools can't find the bugs because they involve these magical abstractions that require some analyst 
thinking about several different pieces of the code base at one time, those are actually going to be even harder to find with just the basic tools. Um, so we're seeing an increased number of like lines of code, um, you know, open source projects every day, and consequently a growing number of exploitable vulnerabilities that are likely in that code. Security as it's practiced right now does not necessarily scale. There are some scalable things, but like in general, it doesn't super scale well. Um, and we think that it'll probably get harder and harder for defenders, um, especially as advancements in automated bug fund. Uh, bug finding unfold. So when we talk about tooling not being very good, tooling is going to get better over time. And the real thing is, who's using that tooling? Is it the defenders and the maintainers finding the bugs before they commit stuff or or very early on? Or is it that you know people with malicious intent, perhaps out in the wild on the internet, are making use of these tools? And that's, that's the big tension, I think. Um, so some of the things that we worry about when we think about def uh, attackers getting really good would be like large large scale fuzzing, um, innovations in something called program analysis, wiki that if you've never seen it, it's um, a way, ways of looking at code for vulnerabilities. Um, but we've also seen query languages like CodeQL where you can find classes of vulnerabilities across many code bases. Um, we've also seen some good work with machine learning over source code to identify certain patterns in which vulnerabilities tend to show up. Um, there's even a field in security known as automated exploit generation, AEG, which is all about if you find a bug, how to chain stuff together in an efficient way so that you can start exploiting it quickly. So there's a lot of things that will scale up that are scary for defenders. And I think that it's all or it's all about understanding and making use of those in a defensive capacity over time. And by having interve interventions like what we're working on at OpenSSF, we're trying to create a um, you know body of knowledge and body of work where we're able to scalably make use of these innovations to help make open source software more secure. But it's always that tension between the dual use nature of using it for defense or using it for attack. Um, but I think there's reasons for hope. And, and I think OpenSSF is trying to, to build those reasons. Um, others, what are your thoughts? What, what will happen? Will security get better or worse? Well, I, I think if you don't intervene, I mean, it's not going to get better unless uh, you're talking about Bitcoin, right? Then, yeah, it always gets better without doing anything. <laughs> uh, to, jokes aside, I think you, we all, I think you, you raised a good point and everyone raised a good point. Non-technically, too, I think, as we all know, the open source is tremendously growing, vulnerabilities are growing, and also we're seeing highly complex not well-known vulnerabilities introduced every year. So I think we all need to work as a group, maintainers, researchers, and corporations to address the problem. And if we don't do it, we lose this opportunity to fix in the beginning before it, it's uncontrollable, right? And I'll, I'll finish with one thought. It's not always technical though. And most of the maintainers and developers actually are employed by other companies and they have a day job. So you have to work on other stuff other than these projects. So we can't put a burden on these develop, developers and contributors and maintainers to, to keep up the software. So for that, I would say, talk to your employer, talk to your employer and convince them that why this software is helping the other corporations and why, how we are actually taking help from the other corporation so that you get a dedicated time to work on these open source projects. I've been doing in the companies, I've been working and leading is all my developers get a certain time of time of the week to work on contribute back to the open source projects. Okay. I think every corporation like that because it's changing and I see the trends in they're realizing the value of the open source. So they are okay to contribute back. So I would say, Use that, and that's the only way we can scale up. I mean, researchers cannot help single-handedly. Our developers cannot have that, that much burden working on multiple jobs. So that's my final thought. Yeah, so I, 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 you know, I'm an optimist in that. I, I think that there are, you know, changes coming along and, um, you know, things being automated um, that, that will help us. I don't think that this will happen uh, on its own. I think that, you know, without concerted effort, um, the security doesn't get better. Um, but I think that, you know, we are putting that concerted effort in. Um, I think that there's, there's kind of a carrot and a stick aspect to this that will make it, you know, really better over time. One is that developer tooling will get better about having security by default, requiring security as developers create 
new new projects, um, providing information to developers about vulnerabilities and um, steps that they can take and best practices. Um, another piece I think that we'll see uh, happening is some automated infrastructure that allows um, capturing information about what was done during the creation of software and then applying policy about what will, you know, what can be accepted on the other end. And with that cycle of somebody setting policy that says, I, I will only take software that's been um, committed where the code commits are done using two factor authentication. Then all of a sudden, you know, the system starts to build, you know, even more than it is already starts to build that in. So with this, you know, automated system of providing information about what was done, um, uh, having policy that says what will be accepted and some verification of, of policy. Um, that's some some fun stuff that we're looking forward, well, from a corporate uh, point of view that we're looking forward to in the future. From my perspective, we have a boggle where the ecosystem is getting exponentially more complex. You look at vulnerabilities like Spectre and Meltdown, where it re it was a incredibly technically difficult problem to find and then solve, and it involved a lot of different stakeholders across the industry ecosystem. It was a, both a hardware and a software problem. It was a hardware problem that had um, the software was had the ability to help correct. And so we're seeing more of these blended attacks. Things are more complex as that dependency tree branches out. Um, but I am very optimistic about it. You know, we've been involved in the community for decades, and I think this is the most exciting, passionate, talented group of um, developers and practitioners that I've ever had the opportunity to work with. And you know, initiatives like um, the OpenSSF, um, things like the Forum of Incident Response and Security Teams, we're all starting to talk to each other. And the, how we're going to solve this problem of this complexity and this kind of snowballing of the uh, potential for vulnerabilities and threats is communication. It, having these good practices like coordinated vulnerability disclosure, um, having policies or setting expectations and being able to communicate between the different types of people involved in this process. And a lot of the breakdown um, when things go poorly, it's, it's a mismatch of perception that the researcher doesn't understand the developer and the developer doesn't understand the researcher. And the more we talk, the more we have these forums and have resources to help each other out and kind of educate each other, um, the better off we're all going to be. All right. On that note, I think that mostly summarizes what we wanted to talk about today. Um, thank you, everyone, so much for joining us for this panel, um, for staying a little bit late because we had more thoughts we wanted to share, and especially to FOSS Backstage for hosting us today. Um, we're happy to take questions here or in the question meeting room or something that I think exists. So thanks, everyone.